Well, amen. It's great to be back in the great state of Texas. We were up last Sunday and last week into uh, Jay, Maine, a very small town up in the state of Maine, uh, about almost as far north as you can go and stay in America. Uh, and uh, we had a great missions conference that I was preaching, and so I appreciate all of your prayers, uh, and appreciate Brother Dr. Johnson for preaching for us uh, last Sunday, uh, and good, some good things that I heard about the services here. Uh, and I told the people up there, this is the most beautiful state that I do not want to live in. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful place right now. And about three weeks, they said, the snow is going to start falling, uh, and it accumulates to about six to eight feet high, and 20 below zero temperatures in the winter, and I said, this Texas boy's got to get out of here, amen, and uh, so we, but we had a great time, we had one saved, uh, and uh, they gave a lot more, committed a lot more to their missions uh, program than they had before, and so the Lord really blessed, and I appreciate you letting me go uh, and to do those things, but it's good to be back home, amen, and uh, I don't have any more, Lord willing, uh, traveling engagements for the rest of the year, so we're just going to settle in and uh, try to do the best we can to continue to grow in the Lord and to grow our church uh, and to just minister to people through this difficult time, uh, just crazy, crazy times that we live in, uh, and I'm going to be speaking on that in the month of November. We're going to take a break from our series that we're doing Sunday mornings right now that I may know him. We're going to take a break from that for a month, and we're going to talk about prophecy, and we're going to talk about how to live uh, in these unstable times that we live in, and I'm very excited about it. I'd like you to invite everyone that you know that used to come to our church or has never come to our church and be a part of that. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. We're going to have a great time about it. Uh, and then after the service, I'm going to be available in the Welcome Center uh, to fellowship and ask questions uh, after the service if you have any. And so we'll try to answer those uh, as we go along. So I'm looking forward to the month of November uh, and looking forward to what God's going to do in our church uh, through all the different things that we're implementing to try to reach out to people. That's the goal of our church is to be a world mission center and to preach the gospel to every person that lives on this planet. And uh, the Bible says, as we get into the message today, in Proverbs chapter 30, you don't have to turn there, uh, but Proverbs chapter 30 has something, I think, to say to us this morning. In verse 12, the Bible says, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Well, what is God saying there? He's saying there's a generation that thinks that they are pure, and they're not. They think that they are holy, and they're not. They think they're living a good, godly Christian lifestyle, and they're not. Many of you will recall in 2014, a scandal came out of Flint, Michigan. In Flint, Michigan, at that time, they found that there was uh, toxic levels of lead in the water, the drinking water for that town. And as they investigated more and more, they found out that this lead poisoning was at such a level that it could give everyone in the town and in that whole area of that water system, it could give them Legionnaire's disease, which is a disease that is derived from lead poisoning. There were other things that were in the water, but that was the main problem, the contamination of the drinking water in that town. They began to do some studies, and they found that there was an exorbitant amount of children that had birth defects. There was an exorbitant amount, statistically, of people that had cancer and other diseases that lived in that area. And they began to continue to investigate, uh, and they took it to uh, a court, and they uh, did all the things that now you are very familiar with. But let me tell you that after all the dust was settled, there were 12 people that died from this disease that, caught, that was caused by contaminated drinking water. There were 87 other people in this small town that were affected severely with lifelong diseases because of contaminated water. There were also many, many more that left uh, that town. Of course, they fled and went somewhere else. Uh, where the drinking water was not contaminated, of course. And they have lasting scars in their life, in their physical health, because of contaminated water. They say at times, it even came out brown and like a, a really bright orange and green. The water, would you would put it into a bottle or a, a cup, it would be brown or orange or green. Hey, can you imagine your drinking water looking like that? 
when you began to try to make some tea or whatever you were trying to do. You see, the people in Flint, Michigan, up until that time, thought that they had pure drinking water. They thought that what was coming out of their tap was pure. That's what we all assume. Uh, Don't do any tests right now on Sherman water either. If anybody's listening on this, uh, I've filled up my bathtub to take a bath the last four or five times, and the water's green. Uh, So I'm not saying that we have contaminated water, but let me tell you, there are a lot of water systems in America. You can look up the 10 deadliest uh, water systems in America and drinking tap water, uh, and it'll tell you that Houston is one of the worst places in America for tap water. Now, how can we as a society think that we have pure water that we're drinking out of the tap when it's contaminated? Well, in the same way, a lot of Christians in our world think that they're living a pure holy lifestyle, and the truth of the matter is, is their life is very contaminated with the things of the world. Let's look at our beatitude this morning in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at the sixth beatitude now as we have began to study the Sermon on the Mount, and of course the beatitudes are the introduction to the sermon, and we've covered five of them already, and we want to look at the number six uh, today. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 says this, very simply, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now before we delve into the study this morning, we need to understand what the Bible definition is for the words that we encounter in the verse. We understand, and we've made a a lot of this, and we've taught this uh, at the introduction of every sermon so far about the Beatitudes. You need to understand that the word blessed there means that you are happy, but it means so much more than that. It means that you are approved by God if you do the thing that is mentioned in the Beatitudes. So you are not only happy, and you're not only having a joyful lifestyle, but also it goes down to the center of it, it means that what that you are doing, if you're pure in heart in this instance, that is approved by God. God put his stamp of approval on your life if you are pure in heart. That's what it means to be blessed. Now, the word pure, if you just look at a regular definition, it says free from contaminations, foreign objects, and or to be clean. To be clean means to be pure, to be free from any contamination, from any toxins, from any uh, foreign objects that are not supposed to be there. When you purify gold, you take all the dross and all the things, all the minerals and all the stuff that doesn't need to be in there, you clear that out, you clean it, you purify it, and it makes it pure gold. Are you with me? You take all the contamination out, and you have a pure substance. For the Christian today, the contamination that we have to deal with, if we're going to have a pure heart, is sin. The contamination that we deal with in our life, if we want to have a pure heart so that we can see God, is sin. And it's all around us and in us. And so it makes it very difficult to purify your life and have a pure heart. Now, just think about this for half a second. Give this some real thought. What if we were able this morning, and we were going to do it, we wouldn't do this to you, but what if we were able to have recorded everything that your mind and heart has thought about, everything that's went through your heart and mind this last week, and we've recorded every single thought, and we're going to play it right now on the screen for everybody in church to hear. Some of you are going back and saying, well, what did I think about this weekend? Yeah. Hey, listen, nobody wants that to happen. Because we are sinful people. We are contaminated. We live in a contaminated world around other contaminated people. And we ourselves are contaminated with sin. We are sinful. But you know how we get around it to assume that we are pure, like the generation that the psalmist talked about. I believe that's happening in our day. 
People in this generation think they're pure. They think they're great Christians. They think they're living a wonderful Christian life. And the fact of the matter is, is that they're sinful and they're contaminated and they're not even close to being clean. Why would we get that idea? Because we compare ourselves to other people. That's why. You see, I can always find somebody that's dirtier than me. I can always find somebody that's got worse things going on in their life than I have. And so when we compare ourselves to other people, you never get a true representation of your purity or cleanliness of heart. So the only thing that we can do is look to a real clean source. Now, I, I don't know what kind of drinking water you like, but I really like Fiji water. This stuff is good. Now, it's expensive. This little bottle is about $2.40. But it is supposed to be touted as one of the healthiest drinking waters, bottled water, that you can get. The alkaline level, for those of you that are scientists, is 7.2. Anything over 7 is awesome. This stuff comes right out of a mountain spring in the islands of Fiji, and they bring it directly through. They have a, a wonderful bottling system. I'm not a salesman for Fiji water, but this stuff is good. It's good stuff. So if we compare this water to all the other waters, it looks pretty good. But if there's actually small traces of arsenic in it, there's traces of other biochemicals in the water that's there naturally. They didn't put it in there. There are millions and maybe billions of bacteria that are in this water. So now how many of you want to drink it? I mean, I sold you on it, now I told you away, it turned you away from it. What am I saying? There's no such thing as something that is absolutely pure on this earth. You can look at gold, you can look at silver, you can look at diamonds, you can look at anything that you want to. There are trace particles of dirt and rock and all kinds of other foreign objects and substances in this water. It's just so microscopic that you can't see it. And you certainly don't taste it. Let me tell you, when we compare ourselves to other waters, we come out looking pretty good. But let's just compare ourselves to God for a minute. You see, because God is the only one that is perfectly pure and holy. Psalms 99.9 says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Our God that we serve, the Bible God, is completely and perfectly and utterly and always has been and always will be perfectly holy. There is not a foreign object. There's not contamination. There's not impurities. There's not uncleanness. There's not wickedness. There's no little microscopic speck of dirt or dust and contamination in our God. And what's difficult for us to grasp and to understand is all we can do to compare the holiness of God is to compare him to other finite beings and other things that we see and rub our hands on that are already so contaminated that to compare God to those things is ridiculous, it's ludicrous. Even to compare God to the holy angels that are in heaven, there's no comparison. It's ridiculous to make that comparison because God is the infinite, holy, awesome, eternal God. He's the holy one of Israel. How can you compare him to a lowly angel that he created? Look in your Bibles in Exodus chapter 19. And I struggled all week to figure out how to even broach this subject. How do you even help people to understand? I don't understand. How do we help you this morning to understand how holy and pure and clean God is? How do you do that? Well, let's look at some other people's experience with God's holiness. In Exodus chapter 19, in verse 14, the Bible says this. 
And Moses went down from the mount unto the people. This is all the Israeli people. They've been brought out of Egypt. They've been rescued. They've went through the Red Sea. They've had the encounter with the Egyptian army. All those things have happened. They've passed by the waters. Uh, They've done a couple things here. And now they're going to the mountain of God where God's going to meet with them. And notice what happens. Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. Now, you better get clean and take a bath before you're about to meet God, amen? Now, this is what's about to happen. About to meet and see a representation of God on the top of the mountain. God is going to come down from heaven and meet with them on top of this mountain. And let me tell you, you better sanctify yourself if you're in that situation. You better clean yourself up as much as you possibly can. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day or three days from now. Come not at your wives, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Now, you got to get the picture here. Mount Sinai is, you can look it up on Google, you can see what it looks like. It's kind of really not like what you would think is a mountain. It doesn't have this sharp peak. It's it's really like more of a hill looking thing, Uh, and it has a big flat surface up on the top. When you look at those things, you can just imagine now the whole sky turning dark. And all of a sudden, the Shekinah glory of God Almighty, God himself, represented in these things, these attributes of nature, uh, coming down on top of that hill or that mountain, and all the people down around the base of the mountain, in the valleys and all over the place, two million Jewish people sitting out there, and all of a sudden there's thunderings and there's lightnings, and the, the mountainside is trembling, there's a giant earthquake, and all of a sudden those people said, whoa, whoa, <laughs> I don't think we want to do this. They began to tremble. They were scared, as we would say in Texas, out of their minds. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. There was smoke everywhere, like a gigantic volcano had just released itself. There was smoke and lightning and thunderings everywhere. Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. I want you to see that. When God appears to the children of Israel at the bottom of the mountain, he's on the top of the mountain, he appears in the form of fire. There's a lot to be said in the Old and New Testament about God being a fire. Fire is, in its intensity, if you get into blue and black fire, you get into things that are very, very pure in nature. They're very uh, intense, obviously, and they're very purifying. And God represents himself here on the mountain to the children of Israel as a fire. The Bible tells us in another place in the New Testament that our God is a consuming fire. Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake and God answered him by a voice. Now can you imagine being at the base of this mountain? The earth is quaking, everything's shaking. There's smoke and and thundering and lightning and all these things coming out of the top of this mountain. And all of a sudden you hear the voice of God speaking to Moses. Let me tell you, that would make it for an interesting, interesting day. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down and charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount, and sanctify them. Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth. And Moses went down unto the people and spoke unto them. Now let me tell you, they got a real view of who God is. And the people weren't sitting out going, oh, wow, look at how loving God is. He's so, cons- he's so understanding about our plight. And he just understands so much about our situation. I mean, we live in a bad society. 
We live in bad times. It's difficult to be clean and pure. No, no, no. That's not what happened at all. What happened is there was people around the bottom of the mountain, and God himself told Moses, you better make sure those people don't break the barrier and come up here too close. He said, because I'm going to go forth on them. That's not going to end well. Say, so, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, preacher. I thought God was a God of love. He is. But he's also a holy God. And he will not allow sinners that have not repented of their sins to get anywhere near him. The Bible says in the book of Lamentations that it's just by his mercy that we're not consumed. Look at Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. I just want to read a couple verses here, and most of you would be familiar with this text. In verse 1 of Isaiah 6, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. I want you to focus in on verse 2. Above it, above the throne, stood the seraphims. These are the, the holy angels of God that were created just for this purpose. Each one had six wings. With twain, that is two, he covered his face. With twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. So he's got two wings that cover his face. He's got two wings that cover his feet. And he's got two wings that he flies with. And watch what their job is. They've been doing it ever since the creation of time and will continue to do it all into eternity. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God created these seraphims, these angelic beings, just to fly around in the throne room and in the throne area and just declare over and over and over, millions of times now they've declared this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. And these, these angels were created specifically for this job, and yet they're still so vile and so dirty and so unclean and so contaminated that they have to, in reverence, put the wings over their face. They can't look at God with their face. They have to put the wings over their feet because they've been in places that they shouldn't be. Not in a sinful way, but just contaminated because God is so pure and so holy. God created these beings in that way so they could do that. That's how holy our God is. Look at Isaiah chapter 33. Before you think all is, is over and we can't ever approach God and we're going to get zapped by a big giant lightning bolt if we try to go to him in prayer. Amen. I wouldn't want you to leave today with that kind of idea. But I, I do want you to see a little glimpse of God's holiness. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 14 says this. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? That's God. Who amongst us shall dwell with everlasting burning? He that walketh righteously, the Bible says. There are people that can come into God's presence. Even as holy as God is, there are people that can come into his presence boldly, the New Testament says. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of the oppressions, that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. So this person that does those things can enter into God's presence. He shall dwell on high, it says. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. There is a way that we as sinful, dirty, awful, vile creatures can come into God's presence. Even as holy as our God is. But let me tell you, you can't do it by yourself. You can't get yourself to a place where you could approach a holy God that's that holy. The Bible says in the Old Testament that I, the best that you could do, the absolute best thing that you could ever do in your life is as filthy rags in the sight of God. And we got all these people all around America and around the world that are planning on working their way into God's presence. Are you kidding me? 
No, no, no. See, we're comparing ourselves to each other. And we're down here on this little bitty, bitty, bitty microscopic ball in the grand universe or universe. Comparing yourself to other people that he's created and saying, I'm going to get into God's presence. I know he's holy. I know he's pure. I know he's clean. But what I'm going to do is clean myself up enough to get into his presence. No way. Not going to happen. Hebrews chapter 12 says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You can't get into God's presence unless you have holiness. Unless you are perfectly, entirely pure and holy. You say, well, preacher, how are we going to do that? The Bible says in Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the fact that Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross nearly 2,000 years ago and shed his precious blood. His perfect, holy, righteous, clean blood, he shed it on the cross of Calvary for me and for you. And if you will repent of your sins this morning and ask him to come into your heart and save you from those sins and cleanse you of those sins, the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so if you've looked toward the cross and you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, You have had all past, present, and future sins have been cleansed under the precious blood of Jesus. If you have not, you're going to stand before an almighty Old Testament God. It's going to have written down everything that you've ever said or done, and he's going to hold you accountable for it. And there's no amount of good in your piddly little life that's so vile and so sinful and so degraded, so awful. No amount of good is ever going to outweigh your bad. You only, only, only will get into the presence of an almighty, holy God by entering in by the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. There's no other way in. But our beatitude this morning doesn't only talk about salvation and eternity. It talks about right now. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Let me show you this. Matthew chapter 5, the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, the shalls in these verses, sometimes we take it as, oh, way, that's way down in the future. No, this is the promise of God that started out at the beginning of time and is going all the way to the end of time. You can and will, even in the present, you can see God if you have a pure heart. Now, in the old days, when this was written, back in the first century, to see God was a euphemism for having fellowship and conversation and spending time with God. Doesn't mean that you're going to see some vision in the middle of the night. Oh, there's God. Wow, man, that's amazing. No, no, no. If you did that, you ate too much pizza. Amen. God's not going to show you some kind of vision of himself. What you're going to do is if you're pure in heart, you're going to be able to see and fellowship and commune and walk and talk and spend time together with God. That's what he's promising you. And obviously, a a person that can do that is going to be blessed. But you have to be pure in heart. What does that mean for the Christian? We've already had our sins forgiven. We're not talking about our sins, past, present, and future. They're under the blood. Look at James chapter Four. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, in verse 8, we, we know this verse, but we always clue in on the top half of it. It says, James 4, 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Now, if you want to fellowship with God, God will draw nigh to you. He will fellowship with you. Matter of fact, God's greatest desire for you today, Christian, if you're already saved, is that you would come to fellowship with him, that you would spend time with him. God's greatest desire for you is that you would spend every single day a good amount of time fellowshipping with God. That's what he wants. So if we draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to us. But watch what it says. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. 
God doesn't meet with people. Go back home this afternoon and read Psalm 4. God doesn't meet with people that are dirty. That's all through the Old Testament. God does not meet with people that are dirty. How do we get contaminated as a Christian? By sin. If there's sin in your life, God will not come and fellowship with you the way he wants to until you get it taken care of. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Isn't that what it said in Matthew 5, 8? A pure heart, somebody that has a pure heart will see God. But notice the last part that we don't talk about very much. Ye double-minded. What does that mean? Well, if I'm double-minded, it means I have two things I'm focusing on. That's why I'm double-minded. I have two things instead of one. I'm not singularly-minded. I'm double-minded. And that's the problem with a lot of Christianity today. We're not singularly focused on fellowshipping with God. We have all these other things we're worried about. And see, if you would focus in on your life and make the very most important thing in your life is fellowshipping with God, you would get all your sins confessed. You'd get all that dirt out of your life. You'd quit absorbing all the dirt and the sin and the worldliness of this world. And you could be clean and pure in heart because pure in heart in Matthew 5, 8 means that we are single-minded. We're on a one-rail track in our life, and that track leads to fellowship with God. And we're not going to be dismayed. We're not going to be sidetracked. We're not going to be bothered by anything else that doesn't lead down that track. And if you can do that in your life, and if you would do that in your life, you would become single-minded and therefore be pure in heart, and you shall see God. You'll see him. You'll be able to fellowship with him. You'll be able to have some communion with God that you've never felt or seen or, or even fathomed before if you will clean up your life and get singular-minded about serving God and fellowshipping with God. What did you say the greatest commandment is? That we would love God with all, all of our heart and our mind and our soul and our body. If you will try with God's help and God's grace to become pure in heart today, I promise you without any reservation or doubt, you will see God. And you will fellowship with God on a level that you've never fellowshiped with God before in your life. I'm just going to be real honest with you. When I serve God, and I'm singularly minded about serving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and body, I remain singular minded and focused on God. And I see God, I fellowship with God, and it is sweet. It's, it's the most awesome thing ever. But as soon as I let some sin and some contamination get in, that focus goes away. And my fellowship with God goes away. Not because he left, but because I left. And the longer I allow that sin to be in my heart and to be in my life, the further and the further and the further I get away from God. So what do I got to do? I got to come back and refocus. Come back and clean my heart out again. Come back and clean all the junk out of my life. You know, it's like if you're moving somewhere. You got to go out to the storage bin. You got to go out to the garage. You got to go out to the barn. You got to go to the U-Haul place. You got to get all the junk and clean it out because we're moving. We're not taking all this junk with us. <laughs> Amen. I've seen a lot of people do that. Hey, you can't take all that junk into God's presence and expect to fellowship with him. Let me ask you a couple questions. If somebody's funny, do you come with dirty jokes and them saying crude and offensive and blasphemous things? Are you pure in heart? What is your criteria for something that you watch? How holy does it have to be? Have you thought bad or evil 
or angry or even murderous thoughts about people. What if we were able to record everything that you've said in the last week or so? Is it all loving? You see, we don't understand how impure we are because we don't go into the presence of the Holy One and realize how sinful and awful and vile and dirty we are. When Isaiah finished that chapter 6 in that vision of the Lord, he said, woe is me, for I am a man that is undone. I am so sinful. And here's a prophet, one of the most famous prophets of all the Old Testament. And he said, I am so undone. I'm such a sinner. It's unbelievable. I dwell with all these people that are sinners. And he said, Lord, what am I even supposed to do in your presence? And God sent an angel over to the coals and the fires and put it on his tongue and cleansed him from all of his sins. And then Isaiah was able to say, here am I, send me. You know why we don't serve the Lord? It's because we're living a dirty lifestyle. We haven't had fellowship with the Lord. Let me encourage you today. Now, this is, this is the goal. This is the job that you have to do today. Tonight, tomorrow, whenever you have an opportunity, sit down in a quiet place for 30 minutes and ask the Lord, as the psalmist did, to search your heart and show you all the sin that's in your life. Confess all that sin and then spend a little bit of time with God and see if it doesn't change your, your devotion time. I promise you it will revolutionize your devotional life. It will revolutionize the fellowship you have with God. And if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you are not, by the authority of the God's word, I'm promising you are not getting into heaven by your good works. You won't do it. It's only by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that he shed on the cross of Calvary that can cover your sin. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? goal this morning is not to get on to you, not to berate you or to be mean, but my goal this morning is to show you a holy God and then to help you to understand how could we as God's children come into his presence with all the sin and all the vileness and the contaminations, how could we come into his presence and expect to have good fellowship with him? It's not going to happen. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning and God, we've done the best that we can, which is not much, to try to Give the message that you gave to us. And God, I know that there's a lot of people around this world and in churches even today that do not want to think or focus in on your holiness because it helps us and makes us see how and what we are. But God, that's really the only way to have the best fellowship with you and to have this relationship with you that you've designed for us. God, would you help us to understand how contaminated and sinful that we are, how much of sin and and awful things that we allow into our lives every week. God, would you help us? God, would you help us? We need your help this morning to be able to begin to cleanse all of those things out of our lives so that we can have true fellowship with you. You promised us that blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Would you help us to do that today? God, we praise you and thank you for your holiness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.